Hey, this is Vanessa. I want to let you know that this episode touches on themes of drinking and sexual assault. There's nothing super graphic, but if you're listening with kids or this topic is particularly rough for you, I wanted you to know. Hub and Spoke. Audio Collective. Listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. I've gone to lots of bars in the context of playing and hearing live music, and I believe that anyone who wants to go out at night to a bar or club, with friends or alone, for the purpose of hanging out or hooking up, should feel free to do so and be safe. But that's not always the case. And so here is the next installment in the ongoing series about women and the night. I talked to some people who know a lot about bars and the particular challenges these settings pose for women. This is a silly question, but do you think women should be able to go to bars by themselves? Oh my gosh, of course, yes, <laughs> definitely. I do, I definitely do, yeah. I mean, I tend to go, obviously, to places where I know the people who work there just to visit and say hi. But I do really like, you know, if there's a new bar and I want to check it out and I want to have a good cocktail, I would love to just go and sit by myself. Do I go out super, super late by myself? Very rarely. That's just because better safe than sorry. I would love to do that. That would be great if I could just do that. But yeah, I'm probably not going to do that too, too often. That's Mindy. She's a manager at Club Mallard, a neighborhood bar in Albany, California. That's right near Berkeley. What do you see as particular challenges in the bar and club scene for women? I think it's just, one, there's the basic kind of tension about being a woman in the world. (laughs) And then there's the added kind of like, it's in the evening, um, there's alcohol involved. So I think definitely as a woman, you don't want to think that you need to be more careful than a man, but I I definitely think as a woman, you need to be more careful than a man. If you're going out alone even to have a drink, just even if it's at a bar that you know people, just being more aware of your surroundings, how much you're actually drinking, those are all things I feel like you have to just be more cognizant of as a woman. So people of all genders can be harassed and people of all genders can be harassers. And at the same time, we know that the vast majority of harassers are men and the vast majority of people who get harassed are women and LGBTQ and gender non-binary people. So I'm going to refer to them that way. My name is Lauren Taylor and I'm the director of Safe Bars. Safe Bars came out of another organization that Lauren runs called Defend Yourself. We teach people who are targeted for gender-based violence, primarily women and LGBTQIA plus people, skills for stopping harassment, abuse, and assault. And Safe Bars came out of Defend Yourself when a student said uh, they had heard of an organization somewhere using bystander intervention skills to train people who worked in nightlife to prevent harassment and worse. And I was like, oh, we could do that. Like, we totally can do that. So the problem that Safe Bars is addressing is kind of twofold. One side of it is if you work in hospitality, nightlife, any kind of alcohol serving establishment, workplace sexual harassment is very, very bad in those industries. And the other side of the coin is, what do patrons experience, right? What do guests experience when they go out for a night out? And, you know, I think you talk to pretty much any woman who's been in a bar and she can tell you about her sexual harassment experience. And having now, you know, spent a lot of time in bars doing trainings, and I I say bars, but I mean, that's shorthand for bars, restaurants, clubs, concert venues, and breweries. (laughs) 
pretty much any woman can tell you her stories. I've heard many, many stories of really, really escalated extreme harassment. I've heard many, many stories of repeated ongoing harassment. Like I went out one night and I was hit on and touched when I didn't want to be, you know, three times, five times, whatever. The stories are, are really angering and heartbreaking. We know that alcohol does not cause sexual assault, right? That the same people who will harass, abuse, and attack drunk will do it when they're sober. At the same time, we also know that alcohol is used in some ways to facilitate sexual assault. It's used as a weapon to incapacitate someone that they're targeting, and it's also used as an excuse to let the aggressor off the hook. Like, I didn't know what I was doing, I was drunk. A report from 2001 estimated that 25% of American women have experienced sexual assault, with half of those cases involving alcohol consumption by the perpetrator, victim, or both. This presents a unique set of challenges for women and other non-male-identifying people when going out to bars, clubs, and breweries at night. Of course, experienced bar professionals are well aware of this. My name is Summer Gerbing. Uh, we currently are sitting at the Ivy Room, which I own in Albany, California. I have been in this industry for, I think, over half my life now, about 20 years. And yeah, this is my thing. The Ivy Room is a music venue and bar also in Albany, California, right down the street from the Mallard. They're actually both on San Pablo Avenue, a wide, gritty street occupied by bars, restaurants, car repair shops, stuff like that. I started off when I was 16 in a cocktail lounge. I moved to San Francisco when I was 17 years old and worked for a, a place in the Embarcadero for a little bit and then um, started bartending at a place called Columbus Cafe in North Beach. Summer has worked at a ton of legendary bars and venues in the Bay Area. It's all been bartending management. What do you see as the challenges for women in, in bar spaces? When I'm behind that bar, I feel like I have control. When I do go out, which I don't go out that much anymore, <laughs> but when I did go out prior to my twins being born, I felt a lot less safe, for sure. I have been, you know, going out after bartending a big show at the Fox Theater or the Warfield or whatever. We all typically go out together. And I have been given, without my acknowledgement, you know, drugs in, you know, I felt like I have been drugged, you know what I mean? Like in, like our, like in your drink? Yes, 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 yes. Um, that has happened. That's extremely scary. Um, that's happened to me before. I don't remember too much ha what had happened, unfortunately. You know, I do remember just having a couple of drinks with the other staff members and me just feeling completely out of my mind and it was all a blur and I have no idea how I, I got that intoxicated at that point. And my wife was, was, you know, concerned about me when I got home. And then talking to friends the following day, they were like, yeah, you were out of your mind. Like, I don't know what went on. And so, you know, I assumed at that point that I perhaps was drugged. How'd you get home? Uh, I took my friend's Uber, actually. <laughs> That's how I started to talk to my friend. She's like, you took my Uber even home yesterday. I'm so sorry, you know, so luckily the Uber driver got me home safe. Summer was really, really lucky. Lauren from Safe Bars outlines a range of situations women experience on a regular basis. Of course, there's drug facilitated rape where someone puts something in your drink. There's also a lot of unwanted touching. There is a lot of trying to take you to another part of the room, a lot of not taking no for an answer, like somebody will come sit down next to you or come sit down with where you're with your friends and try and chat you up. And, you know, when you kind of give the low-key polite ways of signaling that you're not interested, like they won't give up. And then when, you know, when you actually say like, we just want to talk by ourselves or please leave us alone, people can get very escalated and very handsy. You know, I also think about, like, even kinds of unwanted sexual aggression that are less hands-on. But, for example, raiding the women at the bar for their sexual availability. Or try and get someone drunk to get her to have sex with you. 
all of those kinds of things happen all the time. There is one study that I read about perceived sexual availability of women when they were holding a beer versus when they were holding a glass of water and how men, and of course not all men, but most men, perceive a woman who's holding alcohol to be someone open to their sexual advances, even if she's not. So one of the things that happens a lot also is following, like a guy will follow a woman to her car at the end of the night or follow her to a bus stop or or follow her out to where she's waiting for her ride share. You know, and that even in some ways gets more scary because then there's fewer people around. And then another example that I just thought of, and I've heard many, many stories of this happening, but I also know personally someone who this happened to, that a man followed this woman into the bathroom at a bar and sexually assaulted her there. She was actually on a date with another woman, but he, you know, that didn't make a difference to him. And then, and this is just an example of how hospitality staff can sometimes fail at their job of keeping guests safe and comfortable. A member of the staff at the bar she was being sexually assaulted at came into the bathroom and scolded them both for having sex in the bathroom when she was really being assaulted. That's obviously a horrible, extreme situation on so many levels, and one that could and should have been prevented. Bar staff have a whole host of things they can do to help keep their patrons safe. And also, there's a lot that individuals can do to protect themselves, up to a point. Well, first, let me acknowledge that it should not be on us, right? You know, we shouldn't have to learn extra skills, contort our decisions, you know, do a million prevention things that most women do routinely. We should not have to. But we have to and we do. In the case of bar staff, the good ones take this element of their job very seriously. Case in point... Lauren's safe bars trainings are very popular. In D.C., where we started, people started calling me and saying, like, all the other bars on my block are trained. Can you train us, too? And I was like, of course we can. We've probably trained 40 or 50 bars in D.C., but we've also trained safe bars teams around the country. And so each one of them has trained numbers and numbers of of local establishments that we try to track, but I don't really know how many trained safe bars there are. The staff at the Ivy Room and Club Mallard weren't trained by safe bars, but they do a lot to make sure their patrons are safe and comfortable. That's your job. You are reading that room, you know what I mean? More importantly than that, making that drink, your job is reading that room, reading every individual that walks through that door and making sure everyone is feeling comfortable. And that's something that my business partner, Lonnie, and I take very, very seriously. We are not only, you know, women owners, but we're LGBTQ. This is kind of a home for LGBTQ community as well. So we're extremely all-inclusive and want everyone to feel safe in this room. So that is what we tell most our new hires is, I mean, that's a large part of your job is beyond that cocktail making, beyond mixology, beyond even a conversation with the community and your patrons is making sure everyone is looking and feeling safe. Doug Miller is the owner of Club Mallard and other bars in the area. He's owned the Mallard for 28 years. Back in the beginning, the bar had a lot of regulars. And for Doug, taking care of patrons started with setting the tone for respectful behavior. So we specifically, although being inclusive, we wanted to be inclusive of people that were nice. So we had no swearing that if you swore, you couldn't be served. Also, when I very first started, you had to address the bartender with a please. You know, the tone for any business comes from the top, and that was very, very important to me when I started. Of course, you can set the tone all you want, and some people will still push the limits. So when I first started the bar, the first training I gave was how to clean the toilets. The second training was this is where the beer is. The third one is how to kick people out. And that's manifest itself after 20 years to a policy that is if anyone makes anyone feel uncomfortable in any way, shape, or form, we ask the person that is making the other person uncomfortable to leave. And that's very, very consistent policy. We had 
regulars when I first started, we were a small bar that were school teachers and uh, I had a code word for them that I would ask them about work or anybody that was a regular, I'd ask about work, how was work today? If they said, oh, work was great, they were appreciating the attention they're getting from someone else. If they said, oh, I had a hard time at work, it wasn't really good, my boss was a jerk, I'd just agree to that, understand, and then a minute later, five minutes later, come and ask the, usually the male, to leave. Club Mallard has grown over the years, and there are a lot more people coming through now than just the regulars. So how do you know when someone needs your help? The best way for us to notice it is when our staff notices it. So the greeting at the door, part of that is usually the door person is asked to engage in one or two sentences with someone to see if they're intoxicated, if they're belligerent, if their vibe is bad or aggressive. And if so, they're asked not to come in. If a customer complains, we'll deal with it. And if a staff worker gets a weird vibe, we'll ask that person to leave. And if you respect the boundaries, you're welcome to stay in our happy place. And if you don't respect our boundaries and people's boundaries, you have to leave. What would you say if, say, like, I'm the guy? Or the I'd person? say, um, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to serve you anymore tonight. I'm going to ask you to leave. And then they asked why. I said, well, I'm not gonna talk about it, but I'm gonna ask you to leave. Typically they get angry. I'd say, well, if you wanna know the reasons you wanna talk about it, come with me outside. And once they're outside, I might say, I didn't like your vibe to other customers. I wanna keep everybody happy, keep to yourself next time. If they say anything, I would just say, you're 86, you can never come back, goodbye. You're outside, I go back inside, the story is over. Once they're outside, the situation is uh, effectively dealt with. You know, when this does happen, and it's happened hundreds and hundreds of times, I mean, I can even say, like, once a night it could happen, you know, where you see somebody or a group of women having issues with a particular man. I'm all about being bold when I'm behind there, and if if there is somebody who is not acting appropriately, I will definitely insert myself and ask that person to leave the area. If that person did not leave the area, then we easily will call over our door staff and you know, they will have a talk with that individual. And if it becomes you know, apparent that the individual is not willing to chill out and if they continue disrupting women at the bar then we'll easily just get them out of the venue for the evening. We are I think fine-tuned as to how to get that individual out without causing a huge scene. Hey man looks like you know you're not making these women feel really safe right now we've asked you a couple of times why don't you come outside real quick and let's talk a little bit out there first you know get them outside, you know, they, they might be upset. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, but we give them a pat on the back and, hey man, you know, no problem, you know, you could come back tomorrow. And they never will because they hopefully feel that they were called out. They know that they were being watched and they don't want to be watched and they won't come back. So that's kind of how we have dealt with it in the past and it's worked for us. This is exactly the kind of thing that Lauren teaches bar staff in safe bars trainings. You work in a bar, restaurant, club, etc. What can you do when you see something problematic or someone actually comes up to you and says, will you help me with this problem? The primary training that we offer is active bystander skills. Basically what that means is that you are not the aggressor and not the person being targeted, but you are in a position to witness something problematic. It could be something very low key, like someone making slightly annoying sexist remarks, or it could be something as extreme as a full on sexual assault or anything in between that. But to be a bystander, you're in a position to witness it and in a position to do something about it. And what we do is we boost people's bystander skills. I know from having now trained in many, many, many bars that most people who work in hospitality have good hearts and want to do the right thing, but they don't always have the skills 
And we have a lot of barriers to standing up for each other, things that we've all heard like, it's somebody else's private business, or if I do something, I might make it worse, or what if I'm wrong about what's going on? And that's not just in bars. Those are barriers that all of us have internalized. So our trainings are very interactive, participatory. We don't lecture at people. So we have a lot of discussions and exercises where we help people understand really what is the whole range of problematic behavior all the way from mildly annoying to full-on attack. And then how to recognize those things, hopefully mostly at the beginning stages before they get too bad so that it's easier to intervene and not let them escalate. And then we share with people intervention skills, and then they practice them. One of the things that I've found going into so many bars is that there are a lot of wonderful people in these places who are already doing a lot of good bystander type of things, but they may not have had a chance to share them with their coworkers. Some of the things that people do is just smart and fantastic and amazing. I always think about this one bartender who saw a guy at the bar kind of trying to chat up a woman at the bar and her facial expression and her body language was saying she wasn't interested, but the guy at the bar was not taking the message. And so the bartender like took the guy's drink and moved it like three seats down and said, you're sitting here now, you know why. Like, very simple, very low-key. A lot of people think that to do a bystander intervention, you have to, you know, come in with your cape like a superhero. You have to be willing to get into a fight. You have to be willing to, like, go on a long educational screed about systems of oppression or whatever. And I love that intervention because it's so low-key and yet so direct and effective. And I think about, now this is not one I heard directly from the person, but that I saw on social media not that long ago, where a bartender handed their phone to a patron who was sitting at the bar and said, oh, I really want to show you a picture of my dog or my sister's dog or something like that. But instead, the bartender had written like, don't let this guy follow you because I know he's a problem. Like, make sure you have someone to walk out with. So, you know, these are creative and... I love the creativity of bystanders in coming up of ways to keep their patrons safe and not just bartenders, you know, anybody who works in an alcohol environment. So it could be a server, it could be a door person, it could be a host, you know, really anybody. Safe Bars training divides possible interventions into three categories, direct, distract, and delegate. Direct simply means that you acknowledge that something might be going on. So, for example, the bartender who just moved the drink down and said, you're sitting here now, that's a direct intervention. A direct intervention could also be someone saying, you know, like, hey, that's not really funny. Or, like, looks like she's not interested. Doesn't have to be a big deal, can be very low-key, but it acknowledges that there might be a problem. Distract is exactly what it sounds like. So anything you do to take the attention away from the interaction can break the energy and also can give the person being targeted maybe a a moment to get out of the situation. So you can use your hospitality skills a lot here. Like you can, let me tell you more about our specials, but you can also do other distractions. You know, you could drop something. You can say, hey, they're towing cars outside. Endless possibilities as far as distraction goes. And then delegate is when you get someone who's in a better position to handle it. And a lot of people think that delegate means you have to get someone in authority. And you can get someone in authority. You know, you can get the manager or the bartender, but could be as simple as getting their friends. Like your pal is like a little out of line. Will you go talk to him? One intervention strategy that's gotten a lot of attention in the media in recent years is the use of code words, kind of like what Doug did years ago with the regulars at Club Mallard. In some bars, there'll be a sign in the women's bathroom letting patrons know that if they feel unsafe, they can order certain drinks to covertly signal to the bartender that they need help. A popular code drink is the angel shot, 
ordered straight, it means I need an escort to my car. On the rocks is please call me a taxi, Uber, or Lyft. And with a twist is please call the police. It's been a long time since Doug used code words with the regulars at Club Mallard, and they don't use them at all at the Ivy Room. I think it's a good idea. However, I mean, just seeing the woman's face will tell you everything, you know? I mean, the code word, like, I don't need a code word, I don't think, to know that she feels uncomfortable. I think her body language, her looks to me, tell me everything I need. And perhaps it it works at other venues, but yeah, in my experience with the amount of years, I can tell when a woman is uncomfortable and she needs us to step in. Lauren has strong feelings about the use of code words for patrons to signal that they're uncomfortable or need help. I am actually very against them, personally. And I could send it to you. I wrote a whole essay on it. Okay, so um, Angel Shot and Ask for Angela. I'll first say what I think is good about them, which is that they signal to your guests that you care about their safety. And I know from talking to lots of people, primarily women, who go out at night to bars, clubs, and restaurants, and tap rooms, etc., that they really feel good to see those signs up and to know that they can ask for help. But I have several objections to them. One of them is that, again, gender-based violence is not just committed by men and is not just against women. And if you're going to call these things code words and put them only in one gender bathroom, you're leaving out a lot of people. The other reason that I don't think code words work is because if you Google Ask for Angela or Angel Shots, you'll get hundreds of thousands of hits. They're not code words anymore. Everybody knows about them. So I really encourage people to just be able to say to their server or their bartender or whoever, can you help me? I need help. And, and, you know, put up messaging around that. Put things in the bathrooms, but put them in all the bathrooms because anybody can be targeted, right? Put in messaging that says, you know, the staff here is trained to have your back. Let us know if you need help. The other reason that I don't like the code words and angel shot is is the worst one here, is that they actually ask you to ask for different things depending on what you want to happen. Like, do you want us to call you an Uber? Do you want us to throw the person out? Do you, you know, I don't remember what all the choices are, but they ask you to ask for different drinks, like with a twist, without a twist, with a, uh, on, uh, you know, over ice, not over ice, depending on what you want to happen. And I'm like, who can keep that straight? Especially if you are a stressed, which you would be, right, when someone's bothering you and you don't want them to. And B, you might be drunk. Like, I'm going to remember what kind of drink to ask for. Like, I would just really rather that we let everybody know that they can say to the staff, I could use your help. And because it's so, it's it's so gimmicky, it's, it's kind of... You know, the code word thing is so gimmicky and it, it seems really cool. It's gotten so much publicity and so much news coverage. It's actually not effective anymore. Like most of the time, if I need help in a bar, most of the time I can get up and walk up to the bartender. I can get up and walk up to the host stand. I can get up and walk over to my server and say, can I talk to you for a minute? Like, when would you need a code word? You would only need a code word when you can't get away from the harasser or attacker to be able to say, can you help me? And that's a very small percentage of the time. And once again, if you're in a situation like that and you say, is Angela working tonight? Chances are pretty darn good they know what that means. There's a popular wisdom for women that if you don't want to be harassed at a bar, don't go to one. And certainly don't go by yourself. Summer thinks that's missing the point. I absolutely think a woman should be able to go to the bar by herself. I just hope that if there's anything I could tell myself 20 years ago would be to watch how much you're drinking and 
try not to have the full guards down at that point. It sucks to have to say this, but there's another important thing one can do to stay safe, besides not drinking too much. Don't leave your drink, number one thing. Um, Because? Somebody might spike it. If I see a woman leaving her drink on the bar by herself, I'm going to say something. Or I even will grab it, and I'll put a napkin, I'll put it behind the bar. Whenever you come back, like, let me know. I'll, I'll give it back to you. Or, you know, I can even pour you a half-fresh one. Don't mind. And since even if you watch yourself and your drink, stuff happens. I mean, these days, yeah, I would probably think about what's the parking situation? Are you going to lift your Uber? Maybe let a friend know where you're going. Are you going to be out by yourself? Is someone expecting you at the end of the night? Or just checking and be like, got home safe? And then just, you know, being aware of your surroundings when you walk in, who's in there with you. I actually would also, but I like sitting at the bar, because then the bartender and you could chat and like, there's uh, at least an immediate ally if you kind of need some support. Just little things like that. Finally, knowing how to deal with unwanted attention is imperative. I do think it's important to be clear. You can be firm, but also, honestly, I always kind of approach it more from like a joking kind of like camaraderie style. I like, oh, thank you, like not interested tonight. But making it really clear, like I'm going to have this drink by myself or I'm with my friends. Thank you so much. And ending, ending the communication there, I think one of the, the hardest things I've seen for some women is actually ending the communication. They keep it going for a little too long. And I just always advise, no, just cut it off, head it off from the very beginning. Let them know clearly that you're not interested. Assertiveness and boundary setting are where all safety starts. And then we also teach physical skills for worst case scenario. But you can get out of most things, interrupt most things, stop most things from happening with relatively low-key verbal skills, like just being able to say, please leave me alone. I said, leave me alone. You need to leave me alone. Leave now. You know, having that range in your toolbox and then, you know, feeling okay about asking for help. But I think the most important thing is is to watch the amount of, of drinks you have. And there could have been many situations that I could have had horrible experiences due to my overconsumption of alcohol. And I will do my very best to raise my two boys to watch out for themselves and, and, you know, of course, young women out there. And if they see anything funky going on out there, if they see something that their gut is telling them this is not right, you know, to approach that situation and try to help that woman in need. Which brings us to the overall cultural problem and solution. I think that we need three things, okay? I think of it as a triangle. One point of the triangle is the aggressors who are overwhelmingly men. We need to change the way men are raised. We need to change how people perceive masculinity and what makes a strong man. We need to change all of those things. Another point of the triangle is the people who are targeted for gender-based violence. And we need to empower those people to stand up for ourselves, right? Because we are mostly taught that we shouldn't do that. And then the third point of the triangle is the bystander. Uh, which is the person witnessing the interaction. And even though in sexual assault itself, there's very rarely a witness, there is always a witness to some surrounding behavior, which is like listening to the way your coworker talks about women or watching the way your brother treats his dates. So even if there's not a witness in the moment that the actual violation is occurring, there's always a bystander at some point. And I believe we need to work at all three of those points of the triangle. We need to change the definitions of masculinity. We need to change how boys are raised. We need to start having men hold other men accountable. You know, even if just by saying, that's not cool, dude, right? That, it's just that simple. 
and you know I'm still counting on the men who are doing the work to train men to have a more healthy masculinity and interact with women and LGBTQ and non-binary people differently. But what I say is, you know, how many generations do you think that's going to take, right? It's not, it's not going to change what happens when I go out this weekend or in six months or a year or even a decade from now. We still unfortunately need to be able to take measures to keep ourselves safe. I believe in the measures that empower us rather than the measures that make our lives small. Most of what you hear about self-protective measures and prevention measures are prescriptive and they make your life small. Don't go out alone at night. Always walk with a friend. Don't park next to a van. Don't leave your drink unattended. You know, don't wear a short skirt. They're all about living in fear. And I believe in skills that are empowering and that allow you to live a bigger, more authentic life and be safer when you go out. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon and PayPal. Find out how you can help at nocturnepodcast.org slash support. Extra big thank you to Neil Campbell, who supports us at the Happy Possum tier, which is our highest level of support. Find out more about the show and see all the beautiful episode art by Magdalena Matryka at nocturnepodcast.org. I'll also post a link to Safe Bars and Lauren Taylor's other work in the show notes for this episode. She has a new book coming out in October called Get Empowered, a practical guide to thrive, heal, and embrace your confidence in a sexist world. You can pre-order it now on Amazon and elsewhere. Nocturne is a proud member of Hub & Spoke Audio Collective, a group of smart, well-crafted, independent podcasts. One of those podcasts is Open Source, a show about arts, ideas, and politics. Open Source is actually the world's first and longest-running podcast and is also a weekly show on WBUR in Boston. Find Open Source wherever you listen to podcasts and check out all the other shows in Hub & Spoke at hubspokeaudio.org. Till next time, thanks for listening.